Hello, everybody. Skoda have been sponsoring the Tour de France for the last 20 years. And in this podcast, I speak to head DS for the Tour de France of the Ineos Grenadiers, Steve Cummings, who in the past himself has won two stages of this great race. We look to the past. We look at the big changes that we've seen in the race over the last 20 years. And we take a look into the future with Steve's crystal ball. Hope you enjoy it. Right, we're underway. Well, Steve Cummings, thank you very much, mate, um, for joining us ahead of the Tour de France. Um, where in the world are you, mate? You look very comfy, relaxed. Yeah, I'm at home. <laughs> I've got just doing a few final tweaks for the, well, tweaks, final little bits and bobs for the Tour, yeah, before we go. Just, I mean, we are going to talk, the focus of this of this chat, Steve, is to just reflect a little bit on the last 20 years of the Tour and where it's come from, especially from your perspective, because you've, you know, working as a DS now on the tour, you've won stages in the race, you've you've raced the tour for a, around about a decade or so. You've seen a lot of changes, but just to the here and now, and in your role as a director sportif for one of the biggest teams in the world, just describe the the lead in time now. Apart from doing in- interviews and chats and podcasts, because people want a little bit of your time, what is that world like for you, and and how much preparation? Is there? Is it something you just to give us a sense of what what it's like? Um, well, this is only my second time as lead the S of the tour, and last year it seemed a lot simpler than it's been this year. To be honest, um, he, last year we did Swiss, so there was less time. This year we done Dauphiné, so, so there was less time to to stop and think really after Swiss. Um, but last year we had two positives in COVID. I remember, and there was a bit of. Will they be able to ride? Will they won't be able to ride it? But it, it was quite clear the team kind of almost picked itself. And um, this year has been a little bit more difficult. We've had a lot of injury. And yeah, and also like at the top end of the team, like your GC focus riders, there's been quite a bit of uncertainty around them. And, and that and the position the team's in, that kind of has a knock-on effect to do you select more support riders or do you be a bit more adventurous and a bit take a bit more risk and select more riders who can um, possibly support and possibly win stages as well? So, yeah, and uh, so we've been mo- like, I've personally been monitoring 14 riders on and off for six months and yeah, conversations with those. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm glad, I'm glad like we're really close now to getting, to getting going really. Yeah. And so, uh, from my perspective, I've gathered as much information as I could to make the best decisions, and and it's not me who makes the decisions, but definitely I have an influence. So yeah, I think we we've, we've done a good job there. Definitely, there's some stuff we can learn, and and, and um, in terms of preparation. But yeah, it's it's busy. It's been busy. Yeah, I know. I messaged you a little while ago, and you you said I can't have this chat now. I mean, it just it just there's a lot going on, especially. I'd imagine with the amount of data points that that we have now compared to 10, 20 years ago uh, in terms of the ability to select, to select and, and also recons and stuff. I mean, how how much involvement do you have when you step away from, from the beast that is the Tour de France and, and concentrate on your team? What What is the bit? You can't control everything, Kenny, but what is the bit that's fundamentally the most important to you as a DS then when, when, you're, in, when you're moving in towards the Tour de France? Is it just about the rider selection? Well, other people take care of the recons or do you have to have a real deep view of pretty much everything? Um, yeah, I've done a lot of recons. Um, I do like the route analysis myself, which takes quite a long time. And I just kind of figure if I'm going to stand, stand up there and talk about it and present it, I need to, I feel more comfortable and confident if I know what a little bit, what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My approach. Um, but obviously that's time consuming. So um, I do all that stuff myself, and the most important thing, um, like for me, I think it's like, yeah, you've got to be sort of credible. So you've got the route, you need to know the route, you need to know what you're talking about, you need to understand the opposition, and you need to understand our riders and what their objectives are and what the team objectives are. And you're just trying to get everyone, the whole team aligned from the top all the way down to the bottom, really. Um, 
I'm not sure that's the, the right phrase, top to bottom, but yeah, basically, yeah, everyone riders up to the big, big, big boss. Everyone needs to kind of be on the same page, so we're all going in the same direction together. So, yeah, it's time consuming, but it's also quite, quite good when it goes well. Yeah. Um. Right. Take us back to your. Your first tour was 2010, wasn't it? If I'm, if I'm correct, wasn't it? Way back in 2012. Was to a, yeah, it was it's a long time ago now, mate, isn't it? You know, the time, time's moving on. But yeah. what, what was that experience like for you? You know, you're, a bit, you're obviously riding for, for 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 Sky at the time, but what what was that experience like? Because it's, I, I never got the chance to ride the Tour de France in my in my brief career as a professional, and it's something that I I don't exactly regret, but I'd love to have done it. But to finally get there, and um, before, before five or six years before you won stages. What, just describe what that experience is like as somebody new to it. Well, I think it, I think it's the dr- the dream, as you say, for many cyclists. They they like to go and race the Tour de France, so that's the first thing. So it took, took a little while to get over that, and yeah. um, also just to the battle to get into it. Really, it's um, it's intense, and it I, um, yeah, trying to find a niche and trying to find bring value to to a, a strong team it's not easy um so i remember yeah, well, overwhelmed but it took me a little while to get used to because it's so much bigger than any any other bike race in terms of the yeah. media in terms of the pressure but and i remember just after a point it's sort of, it's sort of like a, a, a switch went on it's like well it's the same teams the same riders it's just more yeah. people and it's a bit, bit, yeah. bit bigger circus and we're just doing what we normally do maybe we go a bit faster because the, the better bike riders and stuff like that but yeah and then you, you, you all of a sudden it becomes quite normal you just get stuck get stuck in but it, i think what's different about the tour is like the intensity of everything's is is more so if there's key points like the battles for those key points start further and further out and that seems if you talk doing a comparison from 2010 maybe the the bunch sprints started 50k to go yeah. now it's be like 70k to go um and then obviously the, the battle at the start maybe is more intense now so it's like there used to be um bit of a lull in the middle and there still often is in stages but that lull seems to have, have uh seems to be getting smaller and smaller and often there's and sometimes it, there is no lull in the stages and yeah of course you had those stages back in 2010 as well where the, the fight for the breakaway is huge and then before you know it you're in, you're into the final um but that's i think that's what's changed maybe um maybe everything's just getting more and more exaggerated all the time <laughs> i mean yeah it, it is i mean from from my standpoint of, as, as a fan and now working on the tour um with with eurosport and gcn and, and seeing it unfold and and also fundamentally as an ex-rider and the way that the racing has shifted and, and then there's a there's been a dramatic acceleration just when you retired just before covid the last couple of years across the board and and forgive me if 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 uh Many people have asked you this same question, but it's I think the the biggest shift in racing has been just over the last couple of years, hasn't it? You know, it's far more unpredictable. Like you say, the patterns that we've been used to before, although each race is unique, there's patterns that you understand and you can sense when there's a tired peloton or an aggressive peloton and there's a rhythm to the race which you can get. And if you've got experience, you can understand it and pass that on to riders. But now the rhythm, the new rhythm is the fact there isn't any rhythm. <laughs> it's just <laughs> chaos, isn't it? And how do you how do you think about how do you can control that? And how do you advise the riders when there's so many different fa- impact factors? Um, and and yeah. Sky and any also a team that like to to control. They like to understand that. Although another thinking of the team shifted over the last couple of years, determined by the way the racing is. But how do how do you get that across? How do you instill confidence in, in the riders and empower them when you've got utter chaos going on um i think yeah i think it's interesting isn't it you 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 sort of pick that apart a bit and you, you say okay why was it like that and it was ultimately i think it was the combination of things really team sky was like the mega team and it seemed to be a, a step ahead of everyone riders went there they improved they got better and they were pretty dominant really and yeah. also then in that era as well Often they had nine riders, so that's gone down to eight. So that's maybe a factor as well. Yep. Um, and then in addition, like other teams have 
stepped up and there's no longer Sky or Ineos is the dominant team. Um, arguably, some might say we're, we've fallen behind, depending on how you look at it. Um, so there's, there's almost like three, maybe four super teams, if you like. And, and as you say, um, they're all trying to get one over on each other. And um, it's no longer... The control of the peloton is no longer as straightforward as it once was. Um, and perhaps as well, some of that's because of these these teams have emerged, they have different ways of trying to control the peloton. Sometimes that's sending riders in front. Um, so that that's quite cool as well because uh, it gives us an opportunity um, to do th- different tactical ideas. And, and yeah, we have to prepare for that as well in terms of how we our training and stuff like that. We, we, the starts of the stages, as you rightly say, are chaotic and you don't know what's going to happen. So you need to be ready. You need to be ready to move early. And um, yeah, that's changed. I, I also, I think um, fueling as well, like um, the sports drinks and stuff like that, that's, that's made a difference. Like riders can now get more carbohydrates into the system. And yeah, that, that obviously speeds the peloton up in terms of intensity and, um, yeah, they're able to ride longer at higher intensities and um, equipment improving all the time. But yeah, it it really is quite exciting because you, as you say, you switch the TV on and 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 it's, it used to be quite predictable, but at the moment it's like really expansive the racing and and it's quite unpredictable. <laughs> so so you never know. I often used to think as well, like back in the sky years, they never really used to film like the first hour or two. No, there's no flag to line, was there? So yeah. Yeah, and and like now it's um for me that's always intriguing to watch like how the race is unfolding because it's so critical really because um you don't want to end up in a situation where you've missed a huge group and you have to use the whole team to to bring it back. So what your role now as a, as a DS compared to when you're riding and and when you're on stages? I mean, how obviously they're completely different roles, but do you do you do you enjoy it? You enjoy your job. It's, it's. I know it's immensely stressful, but do you? I mean, looking at again, touch on Unchained because it is big, and we saw that discussion with Geraint, and then Tom went off and, and won the stage. But so managing, you've got the preparation, that the team selection, which can be a very difficult process, can't it? You know, especially when there's very tight between it's marginal differences between riders. You've got to look at what they're best suited to. Quite often, a rider's season hangs around the tour if that's been their objective altitude the whole process leading to that point they're not selected but and that's something that must be hard to do but as a ds are you, are you enjoying the role you're reveling in it especially in this new era where things where you're going to be learning aren't you it's immensely you're going to have to it's steep isn't it steep. Um, yeah yeah no i do i, I do enjoy it uh, i love you know like when i stopped i was away for a year and that's when i i kept telling myself i don't like it don't like i need to do something else <laughs> But then you just get drawn back in, and uh, particularly for me, the Tour de France. I, I don't know. It's, all, it's just I don't know what it is. It's something about that bike race that is is special to me, anyway. Um, but yeah, I do enjoy it. it, it, it of course, it's it's, I don't know, it's stressful. I don't like to use that word, but it's definitely challenging. And um, and like you say, there's lots to learn, and I feel like I'm in in a good environment to to learn really, and I I. When I came to the team, I said to Dave, I don't want to be a DS. And he's like, okay, well, we need to give you a role. So just be like a second DS. And I was like in an observational capacity, really just observing. And um, and then the next thing is, he's like, well, do you want to lead the Tour de France? Like, okay. That's quite a big step up, mate, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was it was huge. But at, but at the same time, it's, it's like, okay, well, if Dave... He's quite a considered <laughs> and informed guy, so if he's gonna, he's asking me to do it. He obviously sees something they might be able to do quite okay. So, yeah. And then this second year, you just find yourself getting drawn in more and more and more. And if you think about it, like really, I've just been responsible for race strategy and race tactics to a degree. Yeah. To a yeah. degree, it's not always. It's not. It's not. I'm not the only one who decides. There is like a performance group. I do have an influence. I said it before. Um, oh God, I lost what I was saying now. <laughs> um, no, no, but, it's, it's your, okay. your, your your kind of role as a DS. How the the stresses and the challenges of that, and, and you're in 
do, do yeah. you feel like you're you're kind of flourishing, isn't it, as a person? Yeah. So what what happens? So I'll, I'm, uh, if you just think about my role and my responsibility, it is race strategy and tactics. But it's like, where does that end? You know, yeah. like Broad, isn't it? <laughs> I, I want to know, like, when the riders come, I want to be sure, like, they're as good as they can be. And and I find myself getting more and more drawn in and getting really sucked into the detail, which, um, yeah, that's 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 a challenge. It's because it is complicated, isn't it? You know, you, you look at the what's laying ahead in this year's tour. I think the route's a really good one. I think especially the first few stages in Spain is going to be quite, again, it will be quite chaotic. It will be stressful. But but when you're picking a team, you can't just be responsible for picking a team and and not or, or just with tactics. You've got to, to inform somebody just started a streamer off outside, which is, which is great news. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, part two of this interview with Steve, it's taken place in the hallway because they started a strimmer halfway through the conversation. So please do forgive me. But yeah, Steve, so you, you're, you're talking a little bit about, about the role of, of being a DS as opposed to being a rider. And, and like you said, you, you, I don't think you can properly inform strategy unless you understand how a rider acts under stress as well and in difficult situations. I think strategy is one thing as riders learn, but also to form a strategy, you've got to know what a rider's capacity is so that I think they're intrinsically linked. I really do. Yeah, well, we've, we've got data coming out of our, our ears. And it's that, that's another thing. You, you, you go back, um, I don't know, 10 years ago, and obviously there was less, and now there's more and more and more. Um so yeah, that does help us inform race strategy. What what numbers are a good guide, but they're not definitive because there's a human being behind all of that as well. So yeah, exactly. You need to know your riders. You need to know how they are, as you say, psychologically, and how they'll react under certain situations. Um, and then also you need to be able to influence those riders to do things in a better way, I guess. And um, and what about looking back on the, the Tour de France and, and your success? Do you ever have you do you ever dwell on that at all? Every, every time the tour comes around and you had those back to back wins um, a few years ago, you know, uh, do you ever reflect on those and, and draw on your experience from those, or are they now quite a separate thing that you don't really touch on? How do you because you've been picked and selected to to do your job because of your success, because of, of how smart you were as a rider. You rode in a very particular, I would say, idiosyncratic way. You did your own thing uh, quite often against the grain, which is, but when you won races, it wasn't just your strength, which you're, you're obviously immensely strong. You, you were, your critical thinking was was incredible. And, 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 and do you draw on your own experiences of some of your successes, maybe some of your failures to try and influence the riders now? Because I think it's fair to say that you did think very differently. And that clearly for, for, for Dave B and the rest of the team was the thing that attracted you is the way that you think you break down a race. And for younger riders, that's enormously valuable. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I don't, I don't really know. Um <laughs> For me, it's common sense. It's for me, it's common sense, and um, right. I always want to do like the most rational thing, and I always believe somewhere in the middle of it. And and yeah, for sure, I'll just acknowledge it. I wasn't the perfect rider by a long stretch of the imagination, and there's lots of things. Yeah, I wish. Or you, if you go back, you say, okay, maybe you do this different. Maybe you do that different. And do I think or dwell on what I did as bike rider? Absolutely not. It's uh, it's part. It's gone, and it's yeah. You move but at the same time, you know. Every now and then, if someone asks, it's quite nice. You just sort of embrace it. But um, yeah, I just try to do what the rational thing is. And I, I and now, like, if you if you want to say like, what, how do you build tactics or how do you build strategy? I try to like co-create it really. So use all the data, all the all the guys we have, the science stuff, the numbers. Um, yeah. But that's not definitive. To also, do a a series of conversations with all the riders and, and get use their experience in the way try to see the race through their lens and and that helps me grow yeah and, it, and you get this sort of like 360 vision of 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 the race um so yeah that's really cool so as you say i'm learning all the time and and definitely i would say i was a critical thinker yeah yeah <laughs> and what about looking the, the we talked a little bit about the the fundamental shifts in, in in the Tour de France, um, but a lot of those things 
were running parallel in bike racing anyway. It was happening in the Giro. There was this evolution in the way the classics were riding. Racing was changing, and the then the Tour changed. Is there anything specific and unique to the Tour de France that you think that not just sets it apart? We know that, but uh, the evolution of the Tour it was a beast, like course design. Do you think that? You've got we've had different course or like Prudhomme direct directs the race now. Jean Marie LeBlanc back way before you were a pro when I was a kid. And so you do you think that the course design has and and I think it's been quite uh, quite inventive, quite creative, has also influenced the way the race has been ridden. And do you think that there's been a, a distinct evolution in the last sort of twenty so years when you've been riding of course design that has lent itself towards better and more interesting racing? Well, not better racing, but more interesting, unpredictable racing. Yeah, no, exactly. I think the last, the first week of this tour is brutal. Like, yeah. um, it really is. And, and what that's going to mean is we're going to get big time gaps straight away. Whereas I remember some of the earlier tours I did, the the, the time there were sprint stages and everyone kind of stayed on. And and it was like, it was like the fight for position and, and these car bombs were going off like um, crashes and um and you're still going to have the crashes, but. Le- legs legs are going to make the difference a little bit um, on on this first week of the Tour de France, and because there's going to be quite big time gaps, that's going to set the precedent precedent then for for breakaways and stuff like that to be more achievable. And then also the middle of the Tour is just not really much flat. I mean, there are a yeah. few um, sprint days, and it's going to be actually really interesting for me what's going to happen on these days because. Um, they could be like two guys go up the road like back in the day and it was almost like a day off. You yeah. Do less than 200 watts in the peloton for the stage. It could be like that or it could be like a really big fight for the breakaway. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it depends how many sprinters, how many sprint teams, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, it's really interesting. Um. Yeah. After, was it six days? I think we're in the Pyrenees already. And the, the first day... Like when you look at it on paper, position is going to be super important into that final and ultimate climb that Cote de PK. Um, and it could potentially be a GC day right yeah. from, from day one, really. And and the, yeah, with the but also with the bonus sprints, there's bonus seconds available at the top of the climb, so that's going to entice uh GC riders out. So yeah, it's definitely changed the the course design and also thinking on next year as well the starts in Italy so obviously around Tuscany so that's going to be similar in something different but similar there's enough they could there's climbs and stuff around there so it's not like your traditional Mario Cipollini kind of stuff where no. you've got big sprint trains and there's five opportunities for all the sprints. it was almost like a, a tour of like it was like here's your flat stages here's your Alps yeah. a few more flat stages a bit medium mountains maybe and then your Pyrenees this is like it's just every day there's um yeah it, yeah it's quite cool yeah I, I, it, it reminds me increasingly although you shouldn't really each grand tour well to duro the tour de france had its own i clear identity i think it appears to me and i'm, and I'm sure the duro wouldn't mind me saying this is that the tour is becoming not like the duro but in terms of the stage the stages the structure of the stages it's becoming less distinct and formulaic isn't it and i think yeah. that's what's giving us more exciting racing like the duro sometimes stage ones can be a mount not always a mountain stage it's always hilly and sprinters don't always get an initial opportunity but some years they do whereas you're quite right you know 10 20 years ago there was definitely a distinct formula to the race and even these transition stages where you knew a break would get 15 minutes and somebody would win from that you could almost say this is going to be a transition stage and there wasn't a lot of unpredictable racing occasionally there was which was yeah. exciting, but I think, and it's interesting that the Giro, that the tour started in Italy that that it, it it is more similar to the Giro than ever before in that sense. I think. Yeah, exactly. The the other thing we haven't really mentioned as well is um, how teams are going to be able to control the race yeah. on, on such terrain. That's going to be a challenge, and it'll be interesting to see that potentially. I don't know, one of the big GC teams maybe let a breakaway go and, and let someone else have, have the jersey. So that's going to be interesting as well. Yeah, I, th- I think one thing that um, I wondered, and I know it goes on a little bit, when you are in a situation, especially when you've got these three or four super teams now, um, although you've got two riders right at the very top of that tree right now, Vingigo and, 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 and obviously um, <laughs> young Tade. 
when when the racing's on and there are quite complicated situations of dangerous riders up the road, riders who may be moving into the top 10, how much discussion is there inter-team? You've obviously got riders on the road, on the ground, um, team captains having little conversations about, you know, maybe we need to bring this back as a collaborative. Is there much of, are there many conversations, Steve, that go on inter-car between team managers at all? Or is that a thing of the past or occasionally does it happen? Because clearly you're, you're big rivals, you don't want to give too much away, but... Do, are there sometimes little conversations just just to see, just to maybe do a little bit of collaborating every now and again? It's WhatsApp now, isn't it? So WhatsApp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'm going a bit analogue, but WhatsApp chat. Yeah. <laughs> Conversation would be nice now and again. Yeah, yeah. No, um, yeah, for sure. For sure there's a little bit of that where, where you say, okay, we, we'll pull, will you come up later and, and help us? And it's stuff like that. Or, we, you know, we, if you both want the same thing out the race, the same kind of outcome, yeah. Um, then yeah, it makes sense because eventually you work together every day for a long time. So um, yeah, you you if you can if you've both got the same objective, then it, it makes sense to work together. That's just that's cycling, isn't it? I think. Yeah, no, no, totally. And just looking ahead to the get out your crystal, the Steve Cummings crystal ball. I, don't, I think it might be in your drawer at the back there, mate. I've not been, seen it for a while, but the Steve Cummings crystal ball. What, what what do you think the tour might look like? I mean, this is a hypothetical, maybe a bit of a silly question, but it's a fun one. The tour in maybe 10, 20 years time. I and mean, what, what on earth is that going to look like? Did you imagine, especially given what you know and given what we've learned and seen over the last 20 years and then go, go back even further than that, you know, it's still going to be, the big. Yeah. I wonder what. What do you think? What do you think we might see? Just one or two elements that, that might change. It. What, what do you reckon? Mm. It's yeah. It's a bloody good question. That man. the problem with doing this job is you get stuck in the here and now <laughs> a little bit. You don't get. You do, time. yeah. Of course you do, yeah. yeah. You don't get time to have that kind of thinking. But that would that would be really useful to go away and think about how would the race look in ten years? Yeah, it's interesting. Um. As you say, I don't know. You could say now, like it's like the dawn of the the super team almost. So what's how's that going to look like? And it, yeah, I think there's so many factors that 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 would determine that. Um, I don't know. Yeah, you might see them starting further apart, like grand grand deport grand departs outside of Europe. Yeah, yeah, stuff like that. Um. But yeah, the, the tour, I don't know, it's always got like the iconic stages, the iconic climb. So I don't really see that changing too too much. Maybe yeah. the way maybe the way it's raced is going to continue to be. I suspect it's only going to get more intense and more uh dynamic and more like expansive, which which is quite cool. Yeah. I I, I honestly don't know how that's gonna change because with Back ten years ago, we'd, we'd go back to Sky because it's the be- it's one of the best examples in contemporary cycling because they were a team that affected a lot of change across the board in 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 so many different ways. But as you said, and you quite rightly said, you know, you you could look at Ineos now and said, "Oh, we've fallen behind," or is it just that the other teams have catched have caught up? It's a, I think it's a question of optics there, whatever way you. But what what is what is right is that you've got some team, you've got even teams a little bit further down. With smaller budgets they've got all this open source information is there if you, we know what nutrition works and what doesn't you know we know what tech works and what doesn't and and what you have is a and it, it mirrors what's going on in the peloton at higher speeds going towards a certain point in the road where they got to turn right into a crosswind everybody is trying to get there as fast as they can but using as few resources as they can at the same time with exactly the same bit of information and that information is like, well, what's the next level of information is for me? Like, where do we take it now? And that's the search for that. Because so many, so many teams now have pretty much, apart from different individuals, they've got similar, similar data sets, uh, you know. And so we're heading, we're hurtling towards this, this, these particular points where everybody knows what's going to happen or predicting it. And then that is almost carnage, isn't it? You know, it's so... There's that as a as a as a as a constant, and it's like, what, what's the, what's the next level? How do we then develop the sport even further? What how, what can we do that can give us the advantage now? And that's quite an interesting proposition, isn't it? Within this smaller space. Yeah, oh, it, it is. It's hard to imagine 
It, it is exactly like that. We've all got Velaview, we've all got yeah. the weather apps. We all use the uh, the the key points are pretty are often quite predictable sometimes yeah. less um but then there's like this, the skill of all that and and like you say um you want to get there but you do, you want to do it spending as little energy as possible um i don't know i think there's there's obviously there's a lot of stuff you can do in terms of preparation i mean uh, heat training altitude training and stuff like that i think we can really dig deep into to, to improve sure. I'm thinking more like preparation aspect right. that that maybe you just need to rip the script up a bit and try something. Yeah. I mean, in the end, the basics are the basics. Eating well, resting well, and and training well. But what 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 like when you dig right really deep in into that, you know what? What uh, are they? Yeah. What are they? And 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 as you say, maybe like. It would, you think like I don't know, like the capacity of a rider in terms of like what you can do above threshold stuff like that's really interesting to me. Um, yeah, nutritional trends they seem to <laughs> go like this, but yeah, it's it's that's it, isn't it? It's interesting to find that balance between sort of innovation and, and just doing the things that you know really work well. And I think if you go if you lean a bit too far on innovation, you get you get you can get a bit lost. Yeah, you almost try too hard um, yeah. because eventually the wheels are still around. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. You can't reinvent the wheel. So, um, yeah, the basics are just being committed and uh, and yeah, like being willing to sacrifice pretty much everything you have to to be the best you can be. I don't think that's going to change. Yeah, I think that's a pretty decent way to to wrap it up mate it's a bit of good chat sorry about the sorry about the peacocks in the background sorry about the uh the hedge trimming that <laughs> gave us a little bit of an interlude steve but it's been it's been an absolute pleasure to to, uh, to chat it, it always is and i'll obviously see you over at the tour de france mate and um best of luck best of luck to the team thanks, thanks very much. Much. i enjoyed that thank you cheers <laughs>